Well, once we've made it through the white matter, meaning what are the commissural tracks, association tracks, and projection tracks, the next major structure we want to look at inside the human brain is the basal ganglia. And these are made up of three nuclei. They're deep within the cerebral hemispheres, okay? And they're the globus palatus, putamen, and caudate nu nucleus. And what I want to make sure you understand, just by definition alone, is they initiate and terminate movements. You're sitting there thinking, I want to pick up my cell phone and not pay attention to this class anymore. Your basal ganglia is either helping you to suppress that movement or regulate the muscle tone to make sure it doesn't happen. Okay, so one way to think about it is my goal is to make sure you can control yourself when you need to. But if you don't, well, I don't know. I'll see you next semester. Okay, well, what does this look like? You have three areas. Here is this sort of like purplish area, and these are structures inside the central nervous system. And there's that caudate nucleus, and there's that putamen. Okay, and where I'm trying to find it for you here. Where are you? I can't see you. Hmm, where'd you go? Anyway, I was looking for the other structure for you putamen, caudate nucleus. Good enough for now. But what I want to make sure you understand is that. If without that basal ganglia, we do not, we do not have the ability to initiate and or suppress the intention of movement inside of our body. So somehow, well beyond the spectrum of this class, we want, at least I want you thinking, I'm not sure all sections will have you learn this, I want you understanding that just because you think you can do something doesn't mean your body's going to do it. Sit there and think to yourself, pick your nose. Well, you didn't go pick your nose, right? Because on the whole, you're disgusted by the idea. And where does that actually come from? Well, we have a limbic system, which includes the cingulate gyrus, the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, the amygdala, the mammillary bodies, the thalamus, and the olfactory bulb. And they make up our emotional brain. Okay, and it governs all of aspects of our behavior. If you think about your body in terms of, hey, I'd like to do this, but I'm afraid of what it might mean, well, your anger or your fear, your amygdala regulates pretty much all of your anger, right? I mean, this is like the thing that pisses you off and you're like, I don't care what he says anymore. I don't want to study. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> Slam your book shut. Well, guess what? You're no longer learning and you're harming yourself because sometimes... Anger can be good for us, sometimes anger can be bad for us, and all those decisions are regulated through that thalamus. Right, so where is this located? Notice slightly different locations. Here is the mammillary body. There is the amygdala right there. And these are the locations where you're making the decisions to actually have an emotional response to something. And sometimes you can't control it. I mean, think about when you're in traffic, you're tired, you're hungry, you're angry at the world, and it's now 4.05, and your test started five minutes ago. Doesn't matter how nice the old lady is in front of you. You're going to run her over just because she's in your way, and you're angry, and you're afraid you're going to fail this class. Okay? But I want to now switch our attention to the cerebral cortex, and specifically the sensory areas. What are their responsibilities? The primary somatosensory area is this area is called the postcentral gyrus. I'll point it out to you in the cartoon in a moment, as well as the occipital lobe for our primary visual area. Our primary auditory area is our temporal lobe. <coughs> Gustation is going to be the base of the postcentral gyrus. Okay, so when we're thinking about how, what things taste like, that's where that information is traveling to. An olfactory area is the temporal lobe. And put an asterisk next to that because olfaction has its own set of rules. But nudge, nudge, hint, hint, wink, wink. Notice this is the central sulcus here. And this is the post-central gyrus here. And this is the pre-central gyrus here. Notice they're color-coded. And they're color-coded similar to the spinal cord we saw back in chapter 13. And this means... All somatosensory information travels here. All somatic motor information arises here. All this other stuff, yay, knock yourself out. I don't really give a, you know, whatever. Your basic psychology class will tell you, you feel warm and fuzzy over here, and you can speak because of these areas here. Well, yeah, you smack your head in a concussion, you see stars, it's because your primary visual area has been contused and you're causing artificial depolarizations here. That's why you see stars. That's more important. You smack your skull into the windscreen of your car, you've now damaged all of this tissue here. That's your frontal lobe. And this is why you don't think as well as you did before that car accident you had. 
Okay. That's probably more important in your psychology class. Now, what's going on here? Okay. Well, if we think about how we're representing all of these inform pieces of information, these are association areas. What are we doing? We're storing memories, if you will, of electrical information, and that electrical information is made up of alpha waves, beta waves, theta waves, delta waves. I'm a big believer in understanding what all these things mean if you can regulate them. Do you have the mental discipline to figure it out? Here's what you never want to have happen. You never want to be in the hospital and all of these are flatlined. That is literal death. That is the definition of brain death. And that's when they come in and they take away your organs because you put an organ donor sticker on your card, your driver's license. This gives us the opportunity to quickly switch into cranial nerves. And you know there are 12 pair of them. Okay. You know this because I asked you to learn them already, right? And you have nuclei for each of those 12 cranial nerves and maybe you notice that say for the eyes the ganglia of those cranial nerves those nuclei are actually inside the eye or inside the nose right or you but they're the nerves themselves like we studied back in chapter 13 may be mixed nerves meaning they have sensory and or motor but some cranial nerves can be sensory only and some cranial nerves can be motor only only. Okay, so your responsibility now not only was to have learned the nuclei or the ganglia of each of those cranial nerves, but the which ones are now sensory only, which ones are motor only, where are, do you find the ganglia of them? Is it in the medulla? Is it in the pons? Is it in the midbrain? Or the eyes or the nose? Okay, as well as their Roman numerals. We're going to quickly run through these. Right. So here's the olfactory. This one is the special one because it does not travel to the thalamus. It detects materials because the receptors here are constantly regenerating at the olfactory epithelium, dependent upon whatever chemical could actually activate them. I could drop you in outer Madagascar, you could pick up a flower, and your brain would be able to tell you what it smells like because the receptors here are constantly changing themselves. <coughs> Optic nerves, the ganglion cells, La -da -da, are actually in the retina, which means the ganglion cells are down here, which means all of this information is collected into that optic nerve. It travels to the lateral geniculate, which then travels to the actual occipital cortex. We're passing through the radiations well beyond the pay grade of this class, but they reorganize all that information so that you actually have bilateral, three-dimensional, with depth information, so you can see the world in 3D. Our ocular motor nerve. This is the motor cranial nerve. It originates, originates inside the midbrain. And it supplies the extrinsic muscle controls of the upper eyeball and the upper eyelid. This is why you blink. And to make sure you understand this cartoon, what I want you to pay attention to is notice here's what I'm talking about. This is the ocular motor nerve traveling up this way. Superior branch, inferior branch. And you can see how we actually regulate a subset of the muscles here. Notice another trochlear nerve is going to regulate the superior oblique muscle, and the abducens nerve is going to regulate the lateral rectus, lateral rectus muscle. This is why many of your instructors will tell you that you're a visual organism. Well, I can cut all these nerves, and guess what? You're not going to die. Okay? Fact of the matter is, is yes, you may see the world, and your brain may be wired to understand all of the world as a result of internal, I said external visual information but you can live without them. I can't do that to your vagus nerve. Okay, so let's take a look at that trochlear nerve a little bit more closely. Okay, it's the smallest of the train of the 12 cranial nerves and it controls movement of the eyeball itself. Somebody walks inside a room, your eye immediately tracks to where that movement came from. Part of that's from that superior colliculi. Okay, but not all of it is from it. Trigeminal nerve, this is a mixed nerve. It actually has the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular, and it deals with the sensation of touch, pain, and temperature. These are all the things when you're getting to know somebody and they caress your face and you're like, oh, this is so wonderful. Okay, well, that's the exterior sensation piece. Bold, right? But really, it also makes sure that you don't bite your goddamn tongue. Okay, it supplies the muscles of mastication. The appropriate amount of force, take a look here, appropriate amount of force required to actually ensure that 
the jaw moves, tongue is moving properly, and you don't bite your tongue all at the same time. If you've ever done that, you know how painful that is. Where were we now? Trigeminal, here's our abducens. You're going to notice down the lower part here, it's going to actually cause the abduction of eyeball movement, which is the lateral rotation. This is why you can move your eyes in angles, okay, as well as that oblique muscle. There's that trochlear nerve right there, right? We'll come to that, okay? But now things start getting in interesting. Here's our facial nerve. This is number seven. This is the sensory portion of the taste buds of the anterior two-thirds of your tongue, okay? So everything anterior two-thirds, right? So everything you've just ingested, let's imagine you're eating dinner. You're like, well, wow, how did I taste that? Now, you know, it's the facial nerve. But it also deals with the facial expression, okay, from the pons. And what's going to happen, of course, is this is part of your emotional responses to things. I say, like, test on Wednesday. You're going to be like, ugh, scrunchy face. And you can't control it. Okay, so it's kind of cool. Your body has the ability to actually let the world know what you're thinking, even though you may not want it to. We're getting to the really cool nerves now, vestibular cochlear. This is inside lab. You saw this is the cochlear piece. This is where we're going to hear. Vestibular portion is balance, right? For me, the cooler piece, of course, is equilibrium. Okay, and by equilibrium, I mean what does it mean relative to gravity on the surface of the planet? When we think about the, the glossopharyngeal nerve, it's a mixed cranial nerve. Sensory axons carry signals from the taste of the posterior one-third of your tongue. So now we have two cranial nerves that are used for tasting. Okay, but the motor neurons arise in the medulla and they deal with the release of saliva. And this is where Mother Nature, I should say AMP1, and its desire to make sure we don't scare you away, gives you the easy stuff first. That glossopharyngeal nerve, we can't cut that. This is one of those like vagus nerve type moments. You cut that, you don't know what's going on inside your body. So yes, we can taste the world and we will release saliva to make sure we digest materials properly to make sure the bolus of food you're eating doesn't get stuck in your esophagus or maybe stuck in front of your epiglottis so you don't suffocate. Okay. Now let's think about if that is the glossopharyngeal, let's probably think about the most important cranial nerve inside your body, and that's going to be the vagus nerve. So you can see here exiting from the medulla, traveling to all of the viscera of your body. And this is going to be really important for chapter 15. So I'm kind of hoping you're going to see this. Information travels from, say, the aortic bodies, the aortic... So these are actually the carotid bodies. Sorry about that. Aortic bodies here. You're going to innervate your tongue, your lungs, your liver your stomach, your intestines. So pretty much you could say the vagus innervates everything inside your body. It's a mixed cranial nerve, travels from the head and neck into the thorax and the abdomen. And it's everything from proprioception to stretching of the organs inside of your body. Think of this as the mechanism by which you understand what's happening inside your body, even when you're not aware of it. So obviously this means the vagus nerve is responsible for, let's say, autonomic ANS perception and how you deal with it. And the significance here, of course, is that if you're talking, you can't eat. And if you do, it's not a really smart move. You know what's going to happen. Okay. That might be important. You might want to think about that one a little bit. Okay. The accessory nerve. This is a motor cranial nerve. Notice it's motor only. It's going to divide it into the cranial accessory and the spinal accessory nerves. And it's going to supply the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. This coordinates your head movements. Okay. So you have some sensation that's going to now say, well, my head has to move in a specific location. And I can't necessarily control it. And that's actually what's going on. Potentially the third or fourth most important cranial nerve inside your body is going to be the hypoglossal nerve. It's going to conduct nerve impulses for speech and swallowing. As I said earlier, you can't eat and talk at the same time. You can try, and you might even be impressed with your ability to do that and tell me to go, you know, bugger off. But the reality is this. You're flirting with some really major problems there. And all I really want you to take away from this is that, hey, Mother Nature created an entire nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, to make sure that you don't do something foolish like try and eat and talk at the same time, okay? 
So this is a good way to actually end up chapter 14. Um, obviously, you're going to see this last one we focus primarily on the cranial nerves. And remember inside class, at the end of your practical, when I looked at the nuclei on the exam and I saw that you guys hadn't learned them, remember how upset I was. Notice on this presentation here, I didn't even mention them because I assumed you had already learned them. That doesn't mean you don't have to know them. You have to know them. So that means for this per portion, you're looking to figure out which cranial nerve is motor, which cranial nerve is sensory, which cranial nerve is mixed. Where do we find the nuclei of, or ganglia of the, each of those cranial nerves? And what are their responsibilities? Okay. So together, we've introduced the brain, the significant structures of the brain. You know, what is the medulla? What is the pons? What is the midbrain? What is the cortex? And then how do you integrate them? Think basal ganglia. Think reticular activating system. Okay. And that's a pretty good place to stop. So have a wonderful night. And I will, if you're taking this class, I'll see you in class. If you're not taking this class, I hope you enjoyed this. Be safe. Bye.